started on this road as a parent, not as an attorney. Um, in this special education world, that can be very, very daunting, as we all know. Um, as you heard earlier, um, my plan was to become, my goal in life was to be this district attorney, and that was the road I was embarking on until my son was born, and then I was taken on a very different road. Um, on that road, I met so many families that it was truly daunting to hear what a need there was out there. I started looking for attorneys myself because I realized very quickly that the educational system, special education system, is very mm -hmm. complex. And you think, well, I'm a lawyer. How hard can this be? I can do the IEP on my own. I don't need to hire anyone. That was my mentality. So I'll give you just a quick, brief background of my very first IEP. I went with my husband. We're both attorneys. We thought, okay, we can handle this district. Not a big deal. We had, first of all, been trying to see a few, it probably sounds familiar, you want, I wanted a few placements, a few sightings for my son. The person that was assigned to me, our district specialist, had been in Europe for two months. So I was told, well, you'll just talk at the IEP in August, two weeks before the school year was to start. We'll offer you your placements then. I'm at the IEP. Um, I don't receive any of my reports until I'm sitting down at the IEP meeting. This is my first tip to you all. You need to get your assessment reports at least five days prior to your IEP. It is your right. Many times mm -hmm. you're going to hear, we don't have to give that to you. We give it to you as a courtesy prior to the meeting. Absolutely not. You have the right to your child's. And the way to approach this is to say those, these are educational records. They like to say, well, those aren't educational records, they're assessments. That's not true. Anything that personally identifies your child in the school record, that is an educational record. You send a very quick letter that says, please provide me with my IEP assessments five days prior to the meeting because if you're walking into a meeting where you have 15 people in a room that know everything about your child, purportedly, we presume they've all read the assessments, we hope, um, and you walk in and you're being told all this new information and you haven't had a chance to read a single thing, how can you be expected to participate meaningfully in this very important process? You can't. So tip number one, ask for those assessments and do not take no for an answer. Be insistent, call, and if the day of the IEP meeting comes and you don't have your assessments, you continue that meeting. You give them a call and say, I am not prepared to go forward because I don't have any information about my own child's assessments. You continue it, they like to intimidate, they like to tell you, no, you absolutely you can't. They cannot proceed without you. So if I can walk away here today with the feeling that, um, I've empowered you a little bit, I'll feel really good about myself. That's what I wanna do here today is, is let you know that you are in control in that meeting. This is your meeting about your child. It's not about anybody else and no one in that room knows more than you do. And no one there has more power than you do. Whether you know it or not, you do hold that power. And you never have to say yes to anything you don't agree with ever. As much as they try to persuade you, I want you to feel a little brazen. And, and take control of that meeting because this is your child's meeting. Now back to my initial meeting, we get to the IEP, I have no assessment reports. I'm told, oh, you don't get them until the day of the meeting, which as an attorney, I think, hmm, that's, I've got no documentation, I'm just walking in blind. Long story short, they start going over the psychoeducational assessment, they say to me, your son Brandon did great at his assessment with his little mm -hmm. sister present, um, and he interacted so well. I just let them hang themselves raise my hand, I'm like, I have a, a son, as much as I want a girl, I never had a girl, I have a little boy who's six months old, he wasn't at that IEP meeting, so who the heck are you all talking about? <laughs> they all looked at me like, they started looking, um, and then, oh, it was a typo, it just, that was, um, this, sorry, that, we'll, we'll edit that, great. Then they go on to his diagnosis, which has nothing to do with who my son is. Then they go on to tell me that, we all agree that your son ought to be educated in what's called a preschool collaborative, LAUSD. How many here belong to LAUSD? So LAUSD has a preschool system where your child is placed either in a preschool intensive, preschool, preschool uh, mixed classroom, or a preschool collaborative. Intensive is for very severely disabled children with moderate to severe disabilities. Mm -hmm. The middle one mixed is different disabilities, which is basically mild to moderate, and then the preschool collaborative is supposed to be a true collaborative environment with all typical children and a few kids that have IEPs 
or mm -hmm. integrator who, I found, how, who are high functioning. It's a language enriched programs for kids that are young fours that are going into kindergarten, but they're typical children. So at least in this environment, your child with an IEP has the opportunity to have that typical peer model, which is why that's most appropriate. For my son, they decided this is what's most appropriate. It's a preschool collaborative environment. However, we don't have one available for you. All the classes are filled to capacity. So we're going to offer you the preschool mixed program. Like, so you're telling me that the PCC is appropriate for my son, but yet because you don't have a placement for him, you're going to give him a classroom that's more restrictive where he doesn't belong. They all just looked at me. Like the fact that you all aren't answering, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> and at that very moment, I realized, I, I remember thinking to myself, what are families that don't have a clue, that don't speak English, that aren't educated, that are intimidated? I'm not intimidated. You know, there are a few expletives that were said that day before we left <laughs> by my husband. You know, we got to a point where he finally got up and it wasn't pretty. And I just said, you know, I don't know the system very well, but none of this makes any sense to me. As an attorney, never mind as a parent who doesn't have that legal background training that all of this stuff makes no sense to. So I opted. I said, I'm sure there's a system of appeal here. What is that system? They give me all my paperwork. Goodbye. I went to due process. Long story short, they ended up paying for two years of my son's private school, regular private school, with a one to one that he still has today. So my point to you is... Yes, I know the law. Yes, I understand the system. But that's irrelevant. For you as a parent, if you have that fire in you that you know, but for your insistence on advocating for your child, your kid doesn't stand a chance in heck. So the first thing you need to do is educate yourself. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to have a master's degree. On that note, this is my second tip to you. How many of you have read the procedural rights guidelines that the district gives you? It's, it's the parent notice of procedural rights. How many of you have, have read that? Okay, so I'm giving you a homework because that's step number one. All of you, the first thing you should do if you haven't read that manual, they give it to you at every IEP meeting. I'm sure you have a collection that, you know, your entire house can be wallpaper with this thing. And they, every single, so here you go, we've given it to you many times, but you should take it in, the law says. And that's exactly right. They didn't create this nifty little booklet with your rights because they like you and they want you to know everything. That's federally mandated by law. This is created for you to understand your rights. It's created, and it's legally created in a, in a simple format where you can understand. You don't have to be a legal mind to understand your rights. And by law, they can't write it in a complex manner. The typical lay person should be able to understand it. And I've read it. It's pretty simple to understand. I guarantee you all that if you read that and you've never read it before, you're going to have a light bulb go off. Because you're going to learn about so many rights that you didn't know existed. For example, um, I've, I've had a client for some time now. Um, and we were discussing, you know, for the first time, we didn't agree with the school evaluations. If you don't agree with your school assessments, you're not stuck with those assessments. You're not stuck with whatever they offer you or the related services they tell you that your child is entitled to. You have the right to what's called an independent educational evaluation. Most parents don't know this because the district is not going to tell you. Their fallback when you say, well, this evaluation was done. I didn't understand it. I didn't agree with it. I got stuck mm -hmm. with it. So what now? You didn't tell me that I had the right to an IEE. Their response is going to be, we gave you that, that booklet. If you didn't read it, that's on you. We can't force you to read it. We told you, here's your rights. So my point is, this client of mine was shocked because for years before they came to me, they just kept accepting these assessments, thinking, well, we can't afford to get our own. We can't pay $5,000 for a neuropsychological evaluation. So we're kind of stuck with what the school is giving us. You're never stuck, ever. When you don't agree with your child's assessments, you let them know that. I don't agree with this. I want a publicly funded IEE, independent educational evaluation. Many times, if you don't know your rights, you'll get stuck because the district will say, well, you know, we agree with our assessment. We don't think we need to give you an evaluation. It's sufficient. We're standing by it. Well, that's not good enough. Federal law, California law mandates that they then file a due process complaint mm -hmm. against you 
to prove the sufficiency of their evaluation. So they have to go before a judge and prove to a judge that that evaluation is sufficient. Another tip, they won't do that. But you have to know that that's your right. Once you say to them, either A, fund it, or B, take us to due process to prove it. Fund or file, they will give you that evaluation because it's cheaper <laughs> for them <laughs> to pay a $3,000 evaluation than it is to go bother their one general counsel, at least in LAUSD, and have him impacted with now having to deal with this entire mm -hmm. proceeding. If you know your rights and you know that they can't just say, we're not gonna do it, we like ours, it doesn't end there. You then write a letter that says, please go ahead and file against me and prove that my evaluation is sufficient. It doesn't stop there. If they don't do that, you know, the law doesn't give you a specific amount of time in which they have to file, they, they can't have unreasonable delay is what the law says. And in California, basically three months is what case law has proven to be too long for them to file against you. Typically, I would tell my clients, wait 15 days, which is usually the time that the district has to respond to a, a regular school evaluation. So if they don't respond, then you'd write another letter that says, mm -hmm. I'm gonna file a state complaint against you for non-compliance with federal law. You're in violation of IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, that's our Bible. And I'm not saying go read it because it's this big, <laughs> but it is a phenomenal, beautiful, genius piece of legislation. And it's all there for your child. All of your rights are there. You have to understand them, however. And again, that little booklet from the district has it all broken down for you. So the most important rights are there for you so you know what to do. Well, I did ask for the IEE. They said, no, I'm stuck. No, you're not. And most people think, well, I don't know. I can't go get a lawyer to help me. You don't need a lawyer. Learn, read, educate yourself. Everything is online for you. The Department of Administrative Hearings, who is in charge of um, your due process proceedings, they have a phenomenal website and everything is outlined for you. Very simple steps. One, two, three, print this, fill this, give us the statement of facts, what's your resolution, what would you like to see happen here? You mail that in, you'll get your letter, you'll have your meeting with a mediator, which is a neutral person that is there to help you resolve your issues with the district. So my point to you is don't be intimidated by a very daunting system, which I get. It is a very daunting system. But if you know your rights and you know that there are very simple procedures you can follow, you can get to where you need to be. And guess what? When you take that action and when you fight back and you show them, I'm not gonna accept what you're telling me, they're gonna know next time around, they might treat you a little differently. They might consider, hmm, instead of offering them this class, why don't we show them three classes? Because they're gonna come back and they're gonna demand it. So my point to you is, know your rights. I cannot accentuate that enough for you. And again, you can be a millionaire or you can be homeless. If you can read, you can fight for your kid. And that's, that's what I want you to walk, to walk out of here with today is, you're not stuck with anything that they're telling you you're stuck with. You're never stuck. If you understand, you can take it to the next level. IDR, so you disagree. Yeah. In a situation like this one, that it's so blatantly mm -hmm. obvious that they violated the law and that they've not done things properly, I might use IDR. Where, you know, when you file the informal dispute resolution forms, they file them for you at the IEP. They'll fill them out for you, they'll give them to the district. They're supposed to call you within 20 days. Mm -hmm. did, did they call you in 20 days? Wonderful. Most times they don't. We've been told, our office has been told, my probably will tell you, yeah, you're right. We were supposed to call. It's been 35 days, but we don't have staffing. And you know what? We can't help you. Sue us. So that's, they've, they've got their act together a little bit. But there's a time when they, she's calling me saying, they just admitted to me, yeah, we're in violation. What do you want us to do? We have nobody here. We can't help you. So that happens. That's why I'm saying IDR, unless it's a clear, clearly obvious violation where you can say, look, this is what's happening. Let's work it out right now. And the district specialist will say, okay, fine. We'll give you the MPA, whatever. Most times, what will happen with IDR mm -hmm. is you'll receive a notice in the mail that will just basically reiterate the offer of fate that you mm -hmm. received at the IEP, yeah. which is a complete waste of time. So you've just wasted 20 days. Yeah. Instead of 
skip all of that. The second option you have, and you have to be very careful about this option, is mediation. <clears throat> Just mediation, not formal due process mediation. Yes, but, but some, some teams will tell you, well, you can go just to mediation where you get to meet with a mediator, you, the mediator, and the district, uh, and you're not permitted an attorney at this mediation session. It, the reason why I say it's dangerous is because it's, it's, it's binding. If you sign that contract, that settlement agreement, and you go home and you go, I didn't have a lawyer, I didn't talk to anyone, I don't know. You're stuck. It's a legally binding contract, and the only way to disprove it is to go to state court. And it's very hard to do that. So if you go to formal due process mediation, if you change your mind, you have three days after you've signed that settlement agreement. I don't know how that difference, that distinction is made, but it is. But in formal due process, if you mm -hmm. sign and you go home and you just feel like this, this wasn't the right thing, you, you have three days to rescind that contract mm -hmm. and start over. So you have a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a leeway there, um, so you're not stuck. And you're permitted attorneys, obviously. You're an, you know, you can bring an attorney, an advocate. Um, so it's it's a, it's more of a formal process um, than regular mediation. To be honest, I've seen so many shenanigans go on in regular mediation that I don't trust it. So formal due process. You file your mm -hmm. complaint. You go to your mediation session. There's some pretty great administrative, administrative law judges who are assigned as your mediator who truly want to help. The, the point of the Office of Administrative Hearings, who is who oversees this process, they truly want to be able to resolve the matter. And 98% of cases will settle in mediation. Um, everyone understands that if both parties are agreeing to go to mediation, it's because you're going to resolve. Having said that, you've got to go in there knowing you have to give something up. You're not, that's what negotiations are. Both parties will gain, both parties will lose. So for example, if you're going in there saying, I want a non-public agency, and by the way, you always throw the kitchen sink at them in the, in the due process complaint. You ask for the world. And then you get in there knowing what you're willing to give up, you know, art of negotiation, knowing I'm gonna ask for everything and then I'll slowly chip away at what I know that I don't really need. So if you put in there, I want a non-public agency aid the entire year and that's all, I'm, that's all I want, and if you don't give me that, I'm gonna to go to a hearing. Well, that's not a very smart move. You've gotta go in there knowing I'm probably not gonna get a non-public agency aid the entire year. So you negotiate, okay, how about you grant me a block of hours for the first three months of school while my child starts transitioning, let's say, or if it's from preschool to kindergarten or kindergarten to first grade, mm -hmm. or whether it's a big transition from the fifth to the sixth grade, so elementary to middle school, whatever it may be, the point is you're gonna to say to them, okay, Give me my aid so that my child can start without proper support, and we'll meet again in three months. And we'll take a look at how my child is doing mm -hmm. in those three months. And if he's doing great, then fine, we'll fade. We'll start fading that aid, and um, we'll come back to the table and see if that service is still appropriate or not. So that's a negotiation. That could ultimately hurt you because depending on how you negotiate this, it can't be that they say this is a block of hours, mm -hmm. It's not stay put, meaning if you disagree at the end of the three months where we feel that the aid should be faded or we should bring in a public, you know, a district aid, if your contract, if you agree in your contract that you're getting, you know, 120 hours of this support and the support expires at the end of those three months, unless you put on there that stay put continues, meaning if you disagree at that time that you don't want that aid support to end, you can go back to due process and you'll be stay put. The district has nothing appropriate to offer you by law they have to then contract out with an agency or a non-public school so I, that can I, provide that appropriate well, placement. I, I, so with ESY we're dealing with that right now what most districts will do not all districts are the same, but it's pretty much the same when it comes to summer school. What happens is districts don't have any money. This state is broke. I mean, it just is. And that big problem is budget. As much as they may want to give you a program that they really in their heart feel is appropriate, the powers that be have instructed them. Here's what you're limited to. Don't offer past this because guess what? Most families aren't going to ask for anymore. They're going to accept it and walk away. 
For that 12%, 11% kind of fight, fine, give it to them. We're still ahead financially. I hate to put it in those terms, but that's the reality of the situation. It's a numbers game. It just is. So for example, with ESY, LAUSD, for example, your child, my, okay, I'll give, again, my easiest example is myself. My child is in a regular education classroom all year long. His IEP calls for regular education every single year. I have his IEP in February, another tip. Try to have your IEP as early in the year as possible because if you have your IEP, for example, in May and you disagree with our offer of services for the summertime, you have no time to fight that. You're in the summer, you're stuck. You can find something and then file for due process and ask for reimbursement, but this is if you can afford to do that. Most families can't afford to pay for a $5,000 summer camp for their kid. So make sure your IEP is as early as you possibly can. Typically, they go by your child's birth date. But like my child, his birthday is in August. I learned the very hard way. If you wait till the very end of August, two weeks before school started, I had no program for my child to go to. And due process was going to take months. I personally placed him in the school that I knew he needed to be at, and then I sued the district. But not everybody can do that. So what you want to do is now what I did since is I hold my son's IEP every February. So that way I've got plenty of time. If I don't agree with their offer, I file my due process. I've got plenty of time to get it resolved before the school year is over. Um, that's not to say that due process doesn't go through the summer. It does. Just because school ends doesn't mean you can't continue your process. But like I said, for ESY, by the time you're done at the end of the summer, your kid's not had a good program or you're out of $5,000, which you may not get back. You know, you might ask for reimbursement and chances are you're going to get a portion of it. So make sure your IEP is as early as possible in the year. Now, having said that, back to ESY real quick. Your child in the summertime should have, if, if they find that your child qualifies for summer services, for summer school, the standard there is that your child will regress if he's not continued in some kind of a program mm -hmm. through the summer, and your child will not be able to recoup the skills that he loses in the summer when school begins. Most children, all children will lose skills in the summer. They will. But typically developing children will recoup those, sort of those skills pretty quickly, and it's very standard. Kids with autism with different special needs are going to have a much more difficult time regaining those skills. They have to be retaught. By the time they finally reintegrate in the system, it's December and they've lost a lot of time. So the point is, it's regression recoupment. If you can meet that standard, yes, your child qualifies for ESY. They're going to say to you, this is all we have. Take it or leave it. If you don't want it, accept it. It's not our fault. It's, you know, we'd love to give you something else, but this is all we have. Then go to due process. And the argument, I don't want to get too complex with the law, but the argument there is that it's true the district, per federal law, does not have to create a classroom for disabled children if it doesn't have it for regular children. So there is, in LAUSD, no typical summer school right now for regular kids because they can't afford it. However, the district does have what's called the preschool collaborative program during the year, for example, LAUSD. So if they have that during the year, and that's the program your child is in, for example, in preschool, there's no reason why they can't continue because you've created the program. Now you've got to make sure the program is appropriate because typical peers go to that program. So there's no reason why that program can't be extended for disabled children too if that's the program they're in during the year. It's a little complex. The point is they're not offering you an appropriate program. If you want to be able to have your child in, in a program that's appropriate for him or her during the summer, you have to go to due process.